Hello everyone, my name's Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to be covering chapter 5 for our MCAT Physics and Math playlist. And this chapter is titled Electrostatics and Magnetism. In this video, we're going to be covering the following key objectives to help us better understand these concepts. First, we're going to discuss charges. We're going to explore what charges are, the types of charges, positive and negative, and how they interact with one another. This objective will also include a discussion on insulators, which don't transfer charges easily, and conductors, which do. Next, we're going to cover Coulomb's Law. This law helps us quantify the force between two charges. We're also going to introduce the concept of the electric field, which is created by any charged particle, and it exerts forces on other charges in its vicinity. Following that, we're going to dive into electric potential energy. We're going to talk about how the relative position of charges creates potential energy, and then how this energy can be calculated in various situations. Then we're going to discuss electric potential. We're going to explain the difference between electric potential and electric potential energy, and we're going to explore how electric potential varies in different configurations. We're also going to examine some special cases in electrostatics. This includes topics like equipotential lines, which show us areas where the electric potential is constant, and electric dipoles, which are systems with two equal but opposite charges separated by a small distance. Finally, we're going to wrap up the chapter with a lesson on magnetism. We're going to talk about magnetic fields, how they are created by moving charges, and how these fields can exert forces on other moving charges. We're also going to explore magnetic forces, particularly the forces on current carrying wires and moving charges in magnetic fields. Now, before we officially start the chapter, I want to take a moment to explain why this chapter is so important. While the term electricity might immediately bring to mind modern conveniences like lights, motors, and electronics, the role of electric forces is far more fundamental. At the atomic level, electric forces govern the interactions between atoms and molecules. And these same forces are critical to the metabolic processes within our bodies, and they drive the biochemical reactions that sustain life. So in this chapter, we're going to start by focusing on electrostatics. This is the study of stationary electric charges and the forces they exert on one another. Understanding these forces is foundational not just for technological applications, but also for comprehending the very structure and behavior of matter itself. So with that, let's go ahead and begin with our first objective titled charges. Understanding electrostatics starts with understanding what we mean by electric charge and how it governs the behavior of matter at the most fundamental level. In nature, there are two types of charged particles, protons, which carry a positive charge, and electrons, which carry a negative charge. These charges form the foundation of electrostatic phenomena, dictating the interactions between objects on both the microscopic and macroscopic scales. The basic principle that governs these interactions is actually very straightforward. Unlike charges attract, like charges repel. And this principle is one of the key forces shaping matter. Now, historically, the assignment of charges as positive and negative was introduced by Benjamin Franklin. And although the choice of names was arbitrary, what matters is how these charges interact. When a positive and a negative charge come together, they can cancel each other out, behaving algebraically to neutralize one another. Now, if we take a step back and observe the world around us, we notice that most matter is electrically neutral. 
This is due to the balance of charges at the atomic level. So let's go ahead and consider a neutral atom as an example. In the nucleus of the atom, we have protons which carry a positive charge and neutrons which are electrically neutral. Surrounding the nucleus are electrons, each carrying a negative charge. The important thing here is that the number of protons is exactly equal to the number of electrons in a neutral atom. This balance between positive and negative charges is really important to the stability of matter. If this balance was disrupted, if an atom gained or lost electrons, it would become an ion, and it would acquire either a positive or negative charge depending on whether it gained or lost electrons. Ions behave differently from neutral atoms, and that's because the imbalance of charge introduces electrostatic forces that influence their interactions with other charged particles. Now, it's important to note that charges don't remain isolated. They can be transferred from one object to another, and this leads us to the concept of charge conservation. The law of conservation of electric charge states that in any isolated system, the total amount of charge remains constant over time. This means that charge can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only move from one location to another. So for instance, consider what happens when we bring a negatively charged object into contact with a neutral one. Electrons, they may transfer from the charged object to the neutral one, but the total amount of charge both before and after the interaction remains the same. This illustrates that while charges can redistribute themselves, the overall quantity is conserved. Now to quantify electric charge, we use the SI unit of charge, the Coulomb. Coulomb is the unit of electric charge. 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 Coulomb is the magnitude of the charge carried by a single proton or single electron. And while protons carry this charge as positive and electrons as negative, the magnitude of the charge is the same for both. Now that we understand the concept of electric charge, Let's turn our attention to the materials through which these charges can move. Specifically, let's discuss insulators and conductors, two categories of materials that differ in their ability to hold and transfer electric charge. Insulators are materials that resist the movement of electric charge. So when a charge is placed on an insulator, it does not spread out evenly over the surface of the material. Instead, the charge tends to remain localized, staying in one place rather than distributing itself. Because of this property, insulators do not transfer charge easily to other objects. A good example of an insulator is rubber. If you try to charge a rubber object, the charge will remain confined to the area where it was applied and it will not easily be transferred to a neutral object. On the other hand, conductors behave very differently. In a conductor, electric charges are free to move throughout the material. This means that if you place a charge on a conductor, it will spread out across the entire surface of the material. Conductors such as metals, like copper or aluminum, they allow charge to flow freely, and they can easily transfer this charge to other objects. This is why materials like metal wires are used to conduct electricity. They allow charges to move and be transported over long distances efficiently. In short, the key difference between insulators and conductors lies in their ability to transport electric charge. Insulators hold charge in place, making them useful in situations where we want to prevent the flow of electricity, like in the protective coating around electrical wires. 
Conductors, on the other hand, they allow charge to move freely, which is essential in applications where we want electricity to flow, such as circuits and electrical grids. And with that, we've completed objective one, and we want to go ahead and move into objective two. Objective two is titled Coulomb's Law. Coulomb's law quantifies the electrostatic force between two charges. This force is central to electrostatics because it describes the strength and the behavior of the force acting between charged objects. The equation for Coulomb's law is shown here. Fe is the magnitude of the electrostatic force between two charges, and that's equal to K which is Coulomb's constant, multiplied by Q1 and Q2, where Q1 and Q2 are the magnitudes of the charges involved. And this is all divided by R squared, where R is the distance between the two charges. This equation tells us that the force between two charges is directly proportional to the product of the magnitudes of the charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. With that, let's talk about Coulomb's constant a little more. Coulomb's constant K can be derived from the permittivity of free space, which is denoted as epsilon naught. The relationship is that K is equal to one over four pi epsilon naught. And this constant helps us describe how charges interact in a vacuum. This is equal to 8.99 times 10 to the 9 newtons meter squared per coulomb squared. Now, Coulomb's law, it applies only to charges at rest, which is why it's crucial in electrostatics. The force it describes can be either attractive or repulsive, depending on the signs of the charges involved. If the charges are opposite, like we see here, then the force will be attractive and it will pull them towards each other. If the charges are the same, like we see here, then the force will be repulsive, pushing them apart. But what if there's more than two charges? Well, Coulomb's law still holds, but we have to extend our approach. When multiple charges are present, the net electrostatic force on any one charge is going to be the vector sum of the forces exerted by each of the other charges. This means we calculate the force between each pair of charges individually and then sum them, keeping in mind both the magnitudes and directions of the forces involved. Now that we've covered Coulomb's law, Let's expand on how charges influence the space around them by introducing the concept of electric fields. Just as every mass creates a gravitational field, every electric charge sets up a surrounding electric field. This electric field is essentially the region around a charged object where it can exert a force on other charges. It's important to recognize that these fields exist even if no other charges are present in this space. They are a property of the charge itself, much like a gravitational field exists around a planet, regardless of whether another object is in that field. Now, electric fields make their presence known when other charges enter the space of the field. When a charge moves into an electric field, it experiences a force, and the direction and magnitude of that force depend on the nature of both the charge creating the field and the charge moving through it. The force experienced by a charge in an electric field, it can be attractive or repulsive, and this depends on the relationship between the stationary source charge, denoted as capital Q, and the test charge denoted as lowercase q. If the two charges are of opposite sign, then the force is gonna be attractive, drawing the test charge towards the source. 
If the charges are the same, though, the force will be repulsive, pushing the test charge away from the source. Now, the magnitude of this force, it can be calculated using this equation, where E is the electric field strength. This is equal to Fe, which is the electrostatic force, divided by the test charge. And that's equal to K, which is Coulomb's constant, multiplied by capital Q, which is the source charge, divided by R squared. This R is the distance between the source charge and the point where the field is being measured. Now to help visualize electric fields, we often use electric field lines. These lines represent the direction and strength of the electric field. And there are a few important points to remember about electric field lines. First, the lines point in the direction of the electric field at any point. For positive charges, field lines radiate outward, while for negative charges, they point inward. Point two, the number of lines indicate the strength of the field. The closer the lines are to each other, the stronger the field in that region. And our final point is that electric field lines always start from the positive charge and they end on the negative charge. And again, the number of lines starting or ending at a charge is proportional to the magnitude of that charge. I also wanna make a side note that field lines never cross. Why not? Well, because the electric field cannot have two directions at the same point or exert more than one force on a test charge. In short, visualizing electric field lines help us understand how charges interact with each other over distance. For instance, the field lines between a positive and a negative charge will show an attractive interaction with lines curving from one charge to the other. In contrast, the lines between two charges that will show repulsion are going to be curving away from each other. With that, we've completed objective two. We're going to go ahead and end the video here. And in the next video, we're going to start up on objective three. I hope this was helpful. Please let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.